All right, welcome back. So um, we've, uh, I'm going to jump right in here. We've, we've already kind of touched on this a few lectures ago. Uh, we were doing the, the rolling wheel without slip, right? And what we ended up finding out was this really interesting fact about this point C at the bottom. We said that at that one instant in time, at that one instant in time, because the ground is not moving, the ground is at velocity zero, and whatever contact point of the wheel is, is touching that ground, that point must also have no velocity. And what we ended up seeing was that if this has no velocity, then in relative motion analysis, any point relative to this point, this could be a really, really nice reference point that has zero velocity. And in fact, one of the students asked this question, well, is there always a point there that has zero velocity for any given instance? And that is absolutely true. That is the topic of this, uh, of this lecture. Section 16.6 .6 is essentially this instantaneous center of zero velocity. And if I, if I redraw some of those points that I noted on this particular wheel, you'll remember that I had, I believe it was a point B up at the top. This was my VB. And I had a point, I think it was a point E, and it looked like this. And I even had a point D over here, which looked like the following. And you'll remember this because I drew you know, all of those radial lines, those R vectors, and made sure that every single one of these velocities had to have 90 degree angle with my radial vector. And so I purposely drew this arrow look, looking as if it cut through and was not tangent to the circle, that's deliberate, right? Because it is not tangent to the circle, it is tangent, or 90 degrees, or perpendicular, to this, this vector here, rd with respect to c, like that. OK? So for all of these radio vectors, it's a 90 degree angle. And I want to introduce this concept here that I'm going to rename this c. So when, when we do vb, for instance, Relative motion analysis says, let's refer it to any particular point. In this case, let's do C. And we say VB is VC plus VB with respect to C. If we've located that C is, in fact, the instantaneous center of zero velocity, now I can rename my, 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 my subscript. I can use a different letter. And I can simply say that VB is VC. Now it's a VIC. Okay? VIC plus VB with respect to IC. But by definition, VIC is 0. And therefore, anytime you're looking for a velocity, if you've located IC, basically you don't have to worry about VIC, always 0, and you automatically get your velocities just from, just directly from your instantaneous center. So I'm going to note here that this right here, this was my IC for the wheel. Okay, and I'll give you one example now which shows you just how useful it is and how simple it is to get other points once you've located the IC and how to locate this IC. This particular case, let's look at a ladder. So I've got a ladder leaning up against the wall, right at the corner between the wall and the floor. OK, so there's my ladder. And I tell you some points on it. So there's my B point, and here's a point C touching the ground. And we'll say the following. We'll say, we know that uh, VB is given to you. And so VB is negative 6J meter per second. This is a given. You're told that the length of the ladder is 5 meters, and that B and C remain in contact with the wall and the floor, respectively. OK, and you're asked a couple simple questions here. Find the velocity of C, which is the point along the ground, 
And I'm going to locate a point A here, which is the center of the midpoint of the ladder VA. Okay, and I'll give you one dimension here. The ladder is right now leaning up against the wall, and point B is four meters above the ground. Okay? So, your solution is, is going to be like the following. Right? You're going to first think, I need, a, I need a velocity that I know very little information about, but I'm going to refer to a velocity that I already know something about. So your first thought should be, I know a lot about VB. I can do the following. Right? Okay, except you're going to start running into issues where you know, you know, the, the, velo you know the direction of VC, um, but you don't know a whole lot about this VC with respect to B. You actually don't know, you don't even know omega yet, right? So you don't know what the angular velocity omega AB is. <clears throat> okay. So one way to get around this is, what if we tried to find this instantaneous center of zero velocity? Where would it be in space? Okay? And the rule is, if you look at this wheel, here's this, here's this example here. How do we find or locate any point that has zero velocity? In this particular case, really easy because it was the ground. But it turns out that you can locate it really easily by drawing some perpendicular lines. Because this perpendicular radial position vector, if you drew it from this velocity, it cuts through this line, it, it cuts through this point, this perpendicular line also cuts through that point, and this perpendicular line also cuts through this point. Meaning, to locate the instantaneous center, just find two velocities and their directions, and draw perpendicular lines until they intersect. And so if you look at this ladder example, what do we know? We know that this point B must be going straight up and down. So any line that's perpendicular to it has to be a radial line where the IC would exist. So somewhere IC is going to be along that line. So far, still don't know exactly where it is. Then we look at VC, and we know that if this point is going down, this ladder is going to be swinging this way. And so VC is going to be this way. And now I draw a perpendicular line for VC. And the point of intersection is the instantaneous center of zero velocity. OK? OK, so first question that people ask is, well, that's weird. IC is not even on the ladder. OK? But as it turns out, it doesn't matter. Instantaneous center can be any point in space. doesn't have to be on the rigid body itself. OK? And I brought up this example a while ago where I said, look, if you just take the wheel, for instance, you know, a line connecting B and C is essentially just a rod anyways, right? So a rod can have B and C, and the wheel can have point B and C. And so it doesn't matter. The rigid body just has two points that you use for orientation. In this particular case, IC is off of the ladder. OK, so now that we've located IC, I can do the following. I can say VB then must be the same as VB with respect to IC and therefore must be omega AB cross RB with respect to IC. Meaning, I don't need any other point once I've known IC. I can find my omega based on this equation. So this means the following. Magnitude of VB is 6 meters per second. And therefore, omega AB must be that magnitude, 6 meters per second, divided by RB with respect to IC, which is from here to here. OK? And so what is the distance there? Distance there would be hypotenuse minus this, the square, of that, uh, the square root of that. So it would be 5 squared minus 4 squared would give you that triangle. It's essentially a 3, 4, 5 triangle, if you haven't noticed already. 
Okay, so that's a three, four, five triangle. And this divided by that will give you two radians per second. Two radians per second, and the ladder is rotating this way. So that's the direction. Question? Oh, sorry, sorry. Length AB. Did I gave you the gave you the wrong? I'm sorry. Sorry, I labeled this wrong here. In my notes, this is A, and this is B. Uh, this is C. This is a VA, and these are A's. My apologies. A. So, sorry, AB is the length. AB are the ends of the ladder. Sorry about that. Okay? So let's I mean let's just let's just take a look at this, right? Just you got to kind of envision this. This is the center where it appears to be rotating. This point goes down, this point goes across. You can even now imagine if I drew all of these radial position vectors, right? This is an RA with respect to IC. This one right here is my RB with respect to IC, right? And it, it all makes sense, right? Radial vector from that point creating a velocity that is perpendicular to that, to that radial vector, OK? So then with that, I can now solve for both VA and VC. So here's what I would do. I would do VA would be exactly the same as VA with respect to the IC. And therefore, all I need to do is do omega times r. That gives you the magnitude. So omega AB r a with respect to IC is 2. And 4 meters. So VA must be a total of 8 meters per second and going to the left. So negative 8i. OK, and then VC. Okay, VC would be, again, same thing, but now I'm going to have to make sure that I draw this diagram carefully. Here's my four, five, uh, three, four, five triangle again. So this is a four, three, five. And my point C is right there. Here's where my IC is. There's my IC. So this right here, that is my R, RC with respect to IC, okay? which means that the velocity has to be perpendicular to this, like that. B. So VC is going to be omega RC with respect to IC, two radians per second. And then that length right there, as you can imagine, it is half of the 5. So it's just 2.5. So this will be 5 meters per second. And then now you have to make sure that you get all of your angles right in your 3, 4, 5 uh, triangle. And you can, you can try that at home. It'll be negative 4i 
minus 3j. It's like that. OK? So that, that's, your, that's your example there of me you know, connecting you back to the, real, the, the wheel problem, where we first talked about instantaneous center. Now using it for an example where I can, I can just use it for whatever velocity on the ladder that I'm interested in as soon as I've located this, this really useful point, the IC. OK, any, any questions on that? OK, I'm going to get back to this perpendicular lines kind of a problem and, and talk about conceptually what this means for locating ICs. It's so useful that you're going to see it in so many scenarios. That I have to introduce to you some rules. OK, the question was, for this problem, uh, why didn't we use cross products? So I mean, this is, again, you can do cross products, or you can do just figuring out directions and magnitudes, um, and you'll get the same answer. So this answer here, you're more than welcome to do cross products if that makes you happy. Bottom line is, if you drew the diagram correctly, and you made sure you got your 90 degrees and everything else, properly labeled, you should, you should have no problem finding both direction and magnitude at the same time. OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some scenarios here for locating ICs. And they're all, they're all quite different, and, and, but, but very useful in identifying when is a good case and a good situation to do that. I'll repeat in the scenario A what I just did for the latter. So imagine you have a point A and a point B some arbitrarily shaped rigid body. And I tell you directions of two velocities. So this is my A, and this is my point B. Oops. Right? Then following the discussion that I just did with the ladder problem, here's what you would do. You would take both points, and you would draw perpendicular lines. The point of intersection of these two lines has to be the IC. Okay? In other words, the only situation in which, for this particular instant in time, where this point could be moving in that direction and this point moving in this direction is if the body appeared to be rotating around this point. And as soon as you've located the IC, you know that omega has to be in this direction, given my directions for, for velocity. OK? So that is, that is nothing more than me telling you what I just told you for the ladder problem, right? OK, so more scenarios where you could locate instantaneous center. How about if I gave you a problem where I only gave one velocity? So here's the arbitrary shaped rigid body. I gave you a velocity VA, and I told you omega, like, like so. OK? So what do you do there? What you do there is you calculate your RA with respect to IC. So you calculate this. How do you do that? You do your V divided by omega. So if I just took VA divided by my omega that I knew, I would know the length of the R. And then you draw a perpendicular line. And then based on this calculation, you figure out that IC would be this far away from point A. And then you would locate your IC. OK? So given those two pieces of information, you calculate this guy, 
and then you can go either up or down this perpendicular line to find your IC. How do you know if you go up or you go down? With this direction of omega. So say you know that the object is rotating this way, IC has to be down here so that the vector can go in this direction. Right? So it's all about managing your directions and in, in your diagrams. Okay? So that's scenario two. See what else we have here. So see, I'll give you another example. So let's say A and B Let's say I do that. Let's say in this particular case I give you two velocities, but they happen to be parallel to each other. Okay? And so what you would think is, oh, if I drew a perpendicular line through those vectors, I actually only have one perpendicular line at my disposal, and I can't find my IC by intersecting them, right? So how do, I, how do I deal with that? How you deal with that is you basically say, well, if I know these two velocities, think about subtracting them to get you the difference VA and VB, and you can extend it to the VIC. So see here. So basically, if I do the following, you could do this. Just remember that, that rod problem that I did, if you did VB minus VA, you would have this distance, and that would save you. So what you could do is draw and extrapolate this perpendicular line by having the difference between these two vectors, and you could locate IC just from that, just from that extrapolation to the point where the velocity would disappear. Right? So think back. to VA, VB minus VA, divided by VB with respect to A. And this will give you your omega first. And then you can locate your IC the, the way that we located it for the rod a few examples ago. OK, so lots of different things. And let me give you two more to think about. This one here is got V, V, and VA equal to VB. OK, so think about this for a second. <coughs> Rigid body with two points. They, in this case, don't share a similar perpendicular line, and yet these two velocities are the same. So I can draw perpendicular lines like this, and they don't intersect. So where would the instantaneous center be for this particular scenario? Yeah? What's that? It's translating, yeah. Exactly. So if you see this case, it looks like the perpendicular lines never intersect until you go off to infinity, or even if you go off to infinity. This is a case where you have translation. Exactly right. And the object is actually not rotating at all. There is no IC. So think about this. Anytime you see an object like this, if you've located two points, they appear to have velocities that are parallel, right? And they have the same equal value, it is a translating rigid body. Okay? Very, very useful 
scenario to, to see. Okay, and I'll give you one final one. This is my fifth and final, so. How about that? So in this particular case, two parallel velocities VA not equal to VB. And uh, don't share perpendicular. Like that. So an object appears to have these perpendicular lines. They never intersect, very similar to this translation case. But wait a second, the two vectors don't have the same magnitude of velocity. What is going on in this problem? Yeah? Moving and rotating. But, but if it was moving and rotating, we know that you can always break this general motion analysis into translation and rotation. It would still have an IC, though. right? But where's the IC here? It can't intersect. Yeah? What's that? Oh, if it was at B, it wouldn't have a velocity. Nope. Similar to something what we didn't see. No, except the problem is they don't share perpendicular lines, so you can't extrapolate it there. Yeah. In the middle. In the middle. No, so this is actually can't happen. Can never happen. All right? It just because this is a it's a fictitious case, right? It just can't. It simply can. There cannot be an IC located, right? So there's no rotational component to this rigid body. And it violates every other scenario that you've seen, right? You know for a fact that if it were to have different velocities, it should exist along the same perpendicular line that they share. That would be case C. I moved it off, but if I move it off a perpendicular, the only other possibility is it would be translating, right? Otherwise, it should have, it should have at least a slight change in angle. If it had a change in angle, right, then you can draw coinciding perpendicular lines, right? So that was a, was a trick question. You, could, you would never see that. It just doesn't exist, right? OK? All right, so that's your, that's your, um, that's your section 16.6. .6. Any, any questions on locating ICs? You're going to be seeing a lot of that, and I guarantee you it will be very, very helpful if in many of your cases you start looking for that IC, sometimes you might not need it, but in many cases you do. OK. So I want to introduce to you the next section uh, and the final big one for this chapter. And that is, after we've done velocity, what do we have to take care of? Acceleration. So this is going to be your let's do general plane motion acceleration. And we already, we already did this for, for rotating, uh, for fixed axis. So you'll recall I did something that looks like this. I did AP around a fixed point O. I said it must be this, right? RP minus omega squared, RP with respect to O. I did that. And we even did a little bit of a, a physical explanation, right? This one is your tangential acceleration. This one is your normal. So guess what happens when I go to general plane motion? Instead of just fixed rotation, I need uh, the other point to actually also translate. OK? So for general plane motion, Okay, 
imagine this. Okay, it's basically this. Think of uh, the two points again, but in this case, my B with respect to A and my point A, my point A is no longer a fixed point of rotation. It moves also. So this is going to be a translation. That will take care of my rotation, but it will have these two components. So just to write it out in full, plus alpha cross RB with respect to A minus omega squared RB with respect to A. And in this big equation, this one is taking care of everything about the translation of the rigid body. This part is your tangential acceleration. So another way to write this would be, I'll write that in a second, this is your normal. So you'll see me write this a lot. You'll see me write this a lot. I'll write little t for tangential, little n for normal. And that's just that part. Okay. Okay. So, um, the, I think the one the one new thing that I I do want to show you is the following, and I hadn't talked about this before, but um, this one this one's a nice easy one, right? For, for the normal acceleration. It's great because as soon as you've done, typically when you solve these kinematics problems, right, you start by doing the velocity first because the velocity gives you information like this omega. Once you've figured out the omega, it looks to me like you've immediately gotten the normal component of acceleration, so you check that part off. The trouble is whether or not you can actually get this alpha or whether it's given to you, right? So I want to draw your attention to something that we saw before for velocity. For velocity, you'll remember that if we don't have omega, we did the following equation. I said, oh, do a VB minus VA. And if you know the difference between the two, you can divide by its distance. And that gives you this omega value. And then just from observation, you know if it's spinning clockwise or counterclockwise. And this works because if you look at the magnitude, if you look at the magnitude calculation, that formula, it's a linear equation between omega, r, and v. So guess what happens? If I look at the magnitude of this, okay, the magnitude of this, actually this would be an a here. The magnitude of this is effectively just like this, just like this pattern. If I write for you that AB with respect to A for tangential, that particular component of the acceleration is just alpha r. Right? So this is very similar to this, which means that for acceleration, You have, a, you have a very similar analogous equation when you run into trouble. You can find alpha if you carefully consider tangential components. So if you're able to identify the tangential component at B and the tangential component at A, 
you can subtract them, divide by their distance, and it gives you the value for the angular acceleration alpha. Okay? Now that might take you a little bit to, to go back home and, and maybe, maybe you have to look, that out, look at that a couple more times to see the pattern, but um, you have to try out some problems as well just to get your feel for it. The key is rec recognizing that I'm not saying it's the acceleration in total and it's not the normal component. It has to be just the tangential component because that is the component that is related to your alpha. Yeah. It's only the tangential because alpha only shows up in the tangential part. Right? Because alpha is how, how fast your, your velocity is changing in the tangential direction. Right? OK, so let's do a big example. And I'll, I'll only be able to cover half of it today, and then I'll pick it up next class. So I'll do. OK. So here's my example. Going back to my rolling wheel without slip. So I will say, rolling wheel without slip, but in this case, it's actually sandwiched between two conveyor belts. Okay? And the two conveyor belts will each have their own velocities. Okay? So, the, so the first conveyor belt, the one on the bottom, I'm going to give you some information here. This conveyor belt is going to the right. Oops, sorry. Going to the left, velocity 2 meter per second to the left, and the one on the top is going to the right, and this one is at 5 meters per second. And I also tell you the acceleration, so the acceleration of this one is actually 7 meter per second squared. But this one is actually 7 meter per second squared positive i, so going to the right. OK? What does that mean? It means that even though it is heading in this direction, it is actually slowing down. It's decelerating. So its acceleration is that way. And in this particular case, also slowing down, acceleration is 8 meter per second squared to the left. OK, so the disk or the wheel in the middle is in contact with both conveyor belts at all times. And center is free to move left and right. Okay, and then you're asked to find the velocities and accelerations for all the points on the wheel Q, C, N, and P. So this is find velocity and accelerations 
at P, C, Q, and N. Yeah? I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so basically we're looking for lots of information at lots of different points. So immediately we know the following, right? I want you guys to remember that anytime you have something in, in contact with each other, it has to have the same velocity as whatever is in contact with it. So right away we know at least two points. I'll give you the velocity for Q. It's got to be moving to the right. So that's a plus 2i meter per second. Oops, sorry. Minus. And then v, vp at the top is plus 5. OK, now you got two velocities. Next step is. We, we don't actually have omega yet, the angular velocity. We could find that out with these two. So just like I've done before, very good idea to do the following. Vp minus Vq, Rp with respect to Q, like that. All magnitudes. And it looks to me like we have a plus 5i minus a negative 2. divided by the distance of the whole wheel, which I haven't told you yet. Wheel has radius of 2. Radius is 2 meters. So the distance between these two points is 4 meters. So I've calculated omega, and I've determined direction just from observation. It has to be rotating that way, given the way the, the belts are moving. Once you have omega, now I can locate and find all of the other velocities by doing your relative motion analysis. So you're welcome to do the following. You could do vc is equal to vq plus vc with respect to q. Etc. I'll give you another one. We can also do VC is VIC plus VC with respect to IC if we find the IC. Okay, and both of those will work. Let me just give you a hint on to how to find the IC again. Just because it was part of this lecture, let's revisit that. And then I'll give you the answer. So VIC <coughs> looks to me like my VP is there and my VQ is down here. And this is a length 2 and this is a length 5. So what scenario is this? This is the type of scenario where they shared a perpendicular line. And somehow, if you drew your velocity profile, like a linear connection between the two points, you can extrapolate it. So guess what happens? You can actually do this in this particular case. That would be your IC. right? And you can think about it just physically. Does that make sense to you? It certainly does. Think about it this way, right? All of these points from here to here, the IC to point P, it's kind of like that rod again that's rotating that direction. And it's all based on this point. And really what you're trying to do is you're trying to find the distance in between these two that gives you this particular shape.
Okay? And so here's how you would calculate it. Let me, let me just give you the solution. So if this is my distance RP with respect to IC, here's the trick. You basically could say VP must be omega RP with respect to IC. Okay? That must be the case based on the definition for IC. Therefore, this distance must be velocity divided by omega, 5 divided by my 1.75. And so RPIC is 2.857 meters. So given the radius of the circle is 2 meters, point C is actually right here. And this distance here, it's actually just 0.857 below C. It's like a little bit offset from the center, because if, if IC was right at the center, you would expect this and this to have the same velocity, right? the same speed. So clearly, it was offset by that little bit. Okay, But that's great. Now that you have this, you can solve all the other points that you're interested in, including BC. So now we could do the following. VC is omega times RC with respect to IC. So this would be a 1.75 times a 0 0.857, 1.5i meter per second. Okay, so what that means is this particular point represents the axle from our wheel from a few examples ago. If the two belts are moving against each other, the wheel is not only rotating like this, but the center point is actually translating and moving in the, in the horizontal direction. Okay? And remember, if you remember me saying before, a lot of these other points, as it goes around that circle, it's moving forward and going around the circle, so it traces a very different path. The only path that you know for sure is point C. It must be going in this horizontal line left to right, and we proved it here with this value. VC is clearly 1.5 i meter per second. And then finally, I'll give you VN. VN is the following. It's this point right here. Now we can do, say, VC plus Vn with respect to C, or we could just do Vn with respect to IC, et cetera. And I'll give you the answer. 1.5i. 1.5i minus 3.5j. And here's how you know that's right. Because for this particular point, Right? If I'm basing it off of VC, here's what would happen. This is my Rn with respect to C. This is the velocity Vn with respect to C. It has to be straight down J, J direction. And so you can see there, I've got a combination of my VC, which is going forward, and this Vn with respect to C, which is going straight down at negative 3.5. Okay. All right, so a lot of stuff thrown at you here. Next class, I'm going to pick up this example problem exactly where I left off, but I'm going to do all of the accelerations for all four points. The takeaway from this class, instantaneous center. Really, really useful. You've got to find a way to locate it whenever you've got the chance. Okay? All right, I'll see you guys on Wednesday.